Okay, cool. So we should be streaming somewhere. Excellent. Uh, actually, what I do is I bring it up on my, I have a TV in my office. <laughs> I'll I got my second monitor. <laughs> So let me bring up YouTube over there and make sure it's streaming all right. And usually I get a notification from Twitch. There we are. All right. Oh, wait, super hey. awkward to see yourself like five minutes before. Yeah. And the lag shouldn't be that bad. It should only be a couple of seconds. All right. And hey, we're live. It shows up on my TV. That's good. Excellent. All right. So now I got to get into the chat so I can see everything open in browser. Hurrah. No messages. So cool. All right. Twitch is live. So that's good. All right. Twitch. Yay. So, all right. So anyone who's joining in, welcome to the pre-show, <laughs> which has currently like two people. So that's good. Actually, one of them is me because I'm watching on the TV. One okay. might be me. So, <laughs> so the two viewers are the two, two uh, presenters as well. I know that feeling well. <laughs> that's all right. More people will jump, jump in eventually. Yeah. Um, uh, dashboard dashboard man what i need is a dashboard of dashboards definitely because there's like five places i need to go to make sure the stream's running all right all right so twitch is running good that's fine all right one viewer on twitch right now cool so so how often were you doing your wednesday shows Wednesday morning shows. I was going for weekly, um, yeah. trying to do like a 10 minute tutorial um, and then taking any questions. I get like five or six people every week from some, some local places. Yeah. But like, apparently like with YouTube streaming, you get like promoted in search while you're streaming. Uh, so I'd usually get a couple onlookers and yeah, I don't know. It was, it was always a pretty good time, uh, but it's also like a lot of effort too. <laughs> yeah. It's preparing for it. Uh, actually getting your setup going and then hitting live go live is the easiest part mm -hmm. um, well in the first few uh, i was just hoping that i'd get like questions i was just gonna do like a q a show and then no one asked questions and so i kind of changed formats to do a tutorial yeah. first but then i had to prepare for a tutorial so yeah <laughs> all right oh my machine's bogging down now let mm -hmm. me it can't handle all this awesomeness on this it side can't it really can't so that's all right. So as long as I have the chat up, I'm I'm good to go. But let me shut down everything else. That, <laughs> that's bad. Um, also, a nice thing with Zoom is it might lag on my side, but the rendering looks fine. Yeah. Um, all right. Turn. All right. Turn that off. Turn that off. All right, leave the chat up. Yeah, we're getting a good number of viewers in here now. So, oh, nice. So far, so good. Hello, everyone. Hi. You know, if you're out there, it doesn't matter if you're on YouTube, uh, Facebook, or, or Twitch, uh, say hi in the chat. I'd love to talk to you. We'll start the show in about 12 minutes. Uh, and Brian put a request out on Twitter not too long ago, but if you're looking for some feedback on a website that you might have, uh, let us know because we'll, we'll get uh, some free consulting from, from Brian live here on the show. I love doing design critiques. It's my favorite thing. And uh, it makes me wish I had someone that was public. I could show you I say, Hey, go look at this. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. So what I was trying to do when I was doing my live streams was um, just kind of jump in with a project. So have have no plan going in and then you can't really screw up. Um, but it ended up turning into a lot of my talk or a lot of my streams were me preparing for talks. Yeah. I actually found that was a good way to kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> was all right, well, I have a new talk at KCDC next week let me work on that talk live 
because I, I can get some good feedback from the audience and it's something I have to do anyway. So I might as well get some streaming credit for it. True. True. While I'm doing it. Um, so my, my current project is it's a talk on text adventure games. Nice. <laughs> and you've done those back in the day. Yeah. The, the idea I had was my first programming experience uh, was writing a text adventure in QBasic. Nice. And I, I remember like copying the code out of the book and like, and what I didn't really appreciate then was the, the subsystems necessary for text adventure games are kind of complex. Um, and we, we can solve those problems so much easier nowadays with just with traditional programming contracts in a lot of languages. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I have a talk I put together that's on, let's talk about the hard problems in text adventure games and how do we solve that in a modern programming language? Nice. And, and what's really nice about it is it's, like, it's just my opinion. What I've kind of figured out doesn't mean that's the way it needs to be. It's just, well, I sat down and I wrote a dumb little project that solved these problems and let's just move forward. Yeah. Like the hardest problem in a text adventure game is uh, parsing strings. So you write a command mm -hmm. and you need to parse that into an intent. Well, that's a problem we're still solving today with voice applications. Yep. You talk to your Echo or to your uh, Google Home device and it's like, well, whatever I say, that has to first get translated into a string of text and then has to get turned into an intent. Like what is it the person wants to do? Yeah. Um, so I, I think easily 15 minutes of that talk is just going to be on string parsing and like, all right, how do we get this to a command that the, our, our uh, game can understand? Mm -hmm. Well, because yeah. even back in the day, like it, you had to use the simplest commands possible because no one wanted to write that parsing stuff. Exactly. Yeah, and so so much of my parser is if you use the words a or the, um, we just remove those, just yep. get them out of there and try to get down to the simplest structure possible. Mm -hmm. And then we can look for the commonalities. Um, so I think the version I have also has a synonym um, parser. So if you, uh, what was a good example? Uh, quit versus exit. Mm -hmm. um, like I want to quit the game. I want to exit the game. Well, you type either and it knows, well, if you say quit, quit, exit, um, both mean the same thing. So they both have the same intent. What, what if the intent was to exit the room you're standing in? So in my game, <laughs> they have the same intent. Okay. Um, uh, but like uh, you could say, talk to the the man or the dude or the bro and it all means the same thing you have the same intent yeah um, so trying to take some of those ideas and put them in a very basic implementation where you're not going to build a a triple a game out of out of the framework but you can get through the ideas that yeah all right this is a hard thing to do um and they used to do this on on in little apps that were like 16 K of memory. Yeah. Um, so I had, they do that. I don't know. I, mine, my app is easily like three megs compiled out of the box. So we, we got then, more bandwidth nowadays. We do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's going to be a, a fun talk to do in actually KCDC will be interesting because I I'll do it at KCDC round one. And then I'm also doing it at coder cruise Ooh, nice. in August. Yeah. Um, and so that'll be my round two. And now KCDC will determine whether or not I ever want to do that talk again. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. If that talk just goes down, I'm never going to submit it anymore. See, what you need to do is you need to have that talk and then have a follow-up talk that you can submit that is taking a text adventure game and porting it to an Alexa skill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and talk about that pain. That sounds horrible. Yeah, I no, no desire on that one. So, all right, let's play uh, Zork on on our Echo. Yeah. I won't say her name because I have one in the office and she'll hear me. <laughs> yeah, mine, mine's a couple of rooms away, so I think it's okay. <laughs> but I've got another one a couple other rooms away that responds to Echo and it would be a whole... Yep. whole That's uh, my boys have... One has Alexa and then the other one has an Echo. Mm -hmm. And 
they're they're in rooms right next to each other and just have them have the mental tick to go all right i'm talking to this one it's alexa i'm talking to that one it's echo yep well and, and my, my son just figured out he's, he's three and a half he figured out that alexa knows knock knock jokes <laughs> And so, so, and he can, he does like he he can barely pronounce the word joke, and she understands him. Yeah, it comes out this mangled word, and somehow she tells a knock knock joke. It's it's amazing the work they're doing. It's it's hard to. I, I know that Siri is like the worst out of them. And yeah. then trying to judge between uh, Echo and uh, Google Home. It's like, mm-hmm. I haven't spent enough time with Google Home, but from what I'm told, their voice recognition is really good. Um, I know my echo is amazing. Like some of the stuff she can hear, I could be blaring music at volume 10 and just whisper her name. She's like, what? Yep, <laughs> I'm like, here. I, I got you. And then, uh, she's helped me with my verbal ticks because one of my verbal ticks is let's, and I, I go, let's, uh, and <laughs> so if you say that in one fluent syllable, mm-hmm. uh, it sounds like Alexa and she comes yeah. on. I sometimes I get Echo and, and Alexa from my son just from random stuff. And I have no like it's like Letza, sure that that makes sense to me, but mm-hmm. I'll be saying just random stuff and I have no clue what what she picks up on. All right, what are we doing time wise? We got about four minutes. Four minutes. Uh, we got a good number of people watching, so if you're out there watching, say hi in the chat. Uh, also, I'm amazed like no one's on YouTube. I guess most of that's on Twitch. It must be all on Twitch. Uh, let's see. The Does, cooler place to hang out anyway. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, like 11 folks on Twitch. So that's a good number. Nice. Um, well, ho- hopefully I won't embarrass myself to that Twitch audience. No, the Twitch audience is used used to uh, used to it. There's a lot of live coders on Twitch nowadays. It's yeah. hard to compete. All right. Uh, our friend Jonathan, uh, one of our uh, one of my friends here locally is nice. out there. Hi, Jonathan. I should pull this up on Twitch instead of on YouTube so that I can watch the chat along with you. Oh, so I got to, you know, I should do this. I can embed my chat in a browser. What's the, uh, what's that Twitch URL? Uh, I'm at w- the number one Kev Griff. Um, so it's my uh, Twitter ID. Nice. Use the same ID everywhere. That's the way to do it. Yep. Oh, look, an ad. Okay. <laughs> of course. And I don't see any of that money. That's not even fair. Oh, I know. It'd be like Twitch partner or something to get the the affiliate deals. And you got to hit uh, 3,000 subscribers and 1,000 a, a, and a hours a year of watch time and YouTube to get that. So, oh my gosh, that's ridiculous. That that actually sounds easier than Twitch. Like Twitch, um, to get their highest level, you have to have like seventy five concurrent viewers, hmm. um, or average seventy five concurrent users, which is hard to do. Yeah, um, like even the folks I follow who are who have been doing live coding for. A long time mm-hmm. still don't consistently hit that many people yeah. um it's almost to the point where you have to watch your stats and as soon as your stats hits that magic number you apply for your yep. partnership because you don't know if you're going to have it the next day well i'm obsessive compulsive about stats and analytics so <laughs> youtube provided another avenue for me and i watch it every day along with my google analytics and i feel bad about myself so <laughs> I, I, yeah, same boat. I go through phases. It's like I'm super in the stats and then a month or two later, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm like, you know, I should really get in the stats again. And let me, let me see what people are doing. So I know, you know, what people want. Yeah. Oh, just I'll do whatever I want. That's better. And if they don't like it, fine. They don't have to watch. All right. Let me, I just realized Restream has a, app specifically for chat nice so this might help select all the palm trees geez i hate recapture <laughs> yep i've never gotten a palm tree that's interesting well then they have a tree 
What's that? I always get the uh, click on all the storefronts. I'm like, what constitutes a storefront nowadays? Oh, yeah. huh, okay. Yeah, this works like way better. All right, I'm going to leave. I want to use this instead. All right, well, let's go ahead and go live. Um, actually live now. Yeah, actually live. So live meaning I'll hit record nice. and we'll do the show. Um, all right. And we are live. So welcome to the Swift Kick show, everyone. My name is Kevin Griffin. I'm the owner of Swift Kick, a software training and consulting company based out of Southeast Virginia. And today I am joined by Brian Robinson. How are you, Brian? I'm doing pretty good today, Kevin. How are you? Hanging in there. It's a beautiful day outside, and I'm not enjoying it at all. Well, I'm, it is blisteringly hot over here in Memphis, so I'm glad uh, to be inside. I, I know what you mean. It's uh, it's nice in the air conditioning, like with the windows open and stuff. Yeah, Maybe that's what sunny I'm and beautiful, but no desire to be out there. Yeah. Well, we're live on the internet right now, broadcasting to YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. So if you would like to see the show live, uh. I'll have a list of links where you can go join us in one of those places. Uh, right now, we have a live studio audience hanging out with us. And well, let's start it off with a couple of questions. Let's learn more about Brian. So Brian, if you're up to it, let's let's start with my, you know, just the boilerplate stuff. Sure. Who are you? What do you, who do you work for? And what do you say you do there? So uh, my name is Brian Robinson. Uh, I am a solo entrepreneur at this point, uh, doing design and development educational things on the web. So uh, uh, my main course is a CSS grid course, and I uh, do a lot of tutorials on YouTube, blog a decent bit, that sort of thing, trying to trying to drum up. I kind of I like to think of myself as a um, a freelance, but without the money, uh, dev evangelist for the topics that I like. So I, I talk about CSS a lot, static sites a lot, uh, just anything that catches my fancy from a technology standpoint. Excellent. All right. Uh, so next, well, so we know where you are now. Yes. Uh, tell us your origin story. How'd you get started in tech? Uh, well, it dates back a long time to when I was probably about 14 or so. Uh, my, my favorite, uh, Twitter conversation that happened a few weeks ago was like, you know, what got you into development? And I actually, my first thing was I created a website for, uh, a star Wars RPG that I was playing via email with friends. Uh, and this was back, I used uh, Microsoft, uh, front page to do it. Okay. And oh, so like wow. serious old school stuff. Uh, and then I just kind of lost track of it after that. Like I did a couple of things. I think I made a Father's Day website for my dad. Uh, but then I went into college. I got a degree in philosophy, uh, which is super, you know, useful. Um, I make that joke, but it 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 is. I use it quite a bit. Um, and then I got a job at a newspaper. So as old school as you can get in a lot of ways. But I kind of went into their online department and started doing some content work for them. Gradually did more HTML and CSS. Gradually did more um, um, development, and then. Finally, 14 years later now, 13 and a half years later, uh, doing that professionally for a long time. So uh, awesome. my origin was in newspapers of all things as we watch newspapers crumble around us. It's funny. They can't even give them away nowadays. It's uh, I, I get the the things in the mail. <laughs> the yep. mail say, hey, subscribe to uh, the daily paper for less than one cent a day. And yep. it's like, no. That's all well, right. and, and you'll see, I, I've got a little shade to throw in my, in my presentation because I like to, I've always liked to knock the New York Times design team. I love their special projects, but the, uh, the actual NY Times website has always been just awful. It's, it's an, I've got an older version in the presentation, but to this day, it's not great. I've only ever seen half of the New York Times website because I, get, I you start to scroll down. It's like, oh, I only got three articles this month. Paywalls, got love them. Apparently, uh, and I still don't care enough to to pay for it. Yep. Um, well, excellent. So outside of that, uh, do you have any other hobbies that are not related to tech? Uh, I mean, it depends on what you consider not related to tech. Uh, other than the fact that I've got a three and a half year old that takes up almost all of my outside time and energy. Yep. Um, I, I'm a gamer. I, I like video games, tabletop games. Um, Twitter. I, just, I'm, I read Twitter way too much. Uh, but yeah, movies, TV, games, that sort of thing. And then sleep, because there's just not enough of it with a three and a half year old. What was the last movie you saw? Oh, it's been a while since I've watched anything new. Um, okay. 
last movie I watched would have been probably Into the Spider Verse, I think. Oh, um, okay. Either that, or I don't. I'm, it, it was close to the same time that I saw Endgame for the first time. So, comic. I, I am your traditional geek, one way or the other. I I took my boy, my uh, eight year old. So I have three boys, um, eight, seven, and three. Um, and I took my eight year old to see Far From Home yesterday. Nice. And, it's, it's on my list. Yeah. Oh, it was so good. And my, of course, my eight year old doesn't understand all the connections between that movie and what the other 22 movies in the MCU. Yep. And he's, so he's sitting there and he hasn't seen all of them. He's only seen the ones I've let him see. And I uh, was, he asked me, so uh, Nick Fury's in it and he goes, how do you lose his eye? I'm like, <laughs> okay, you're not going to believe this, but he got scratched by a cat. And he's like an oh, alien cat. though, an alien. an alien cat. And, but if my son was watching Captain Marvel, he would go, Oh, that's just a kitty cat. I'm like, yes, but it's, it's an alien that looks like a kitty cat. Um, and uh, there's some, there's some really good, uh, there's no spoilers, but there's some really good parts towards the end mm-hmm. where he's like, well, who's that? I'm like, well, uh, let me go back to this movie <laughs> and explain something to you. And yeah, having a lot of fun. I wish my son was kind of like five years older and could grasp the entire MCU and like, mm-hmm. he got with him over it. I, I could take those. I could take an eight year old. Eight year old be good. I, I need to advance the three and a half year old. I need a little more, exactly. a little more cognition. Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and turn it over to you. Let you um, go through your content and uh, folks out there in the chat. We put out this advertisement earlier, but if you have a site or a project that you want some critique on, um, constructive criticism, uh, let us know in the chat or on Twitter. And we'll we'll give it to Brian towards the end. Uh, if not, he has some fallbacks. But if you want something live, some free consulting, let us know. And I promise I do not bite. Uh, it is my favorite thing to do is, is to give helpful feedback, especially when the, the person then comes back and says, I implemented it and I get to see it. And it makes me just super happy. Awesome. I need to we'll share, see. see what we get. Share my second screen, I believe. Desktop 2. That looks right. Minimize out of this and share all right is that coming through for you kevin yep looks good to me excellent all right so i i named this uh talk and i've given it a few times now you're a designer i promise and when i first gave it it was before a whole blow up on twitter uh but since then uh there have been multiple people talking about you know definition of design and all that sort of thing and taking uh, oftentimes great offense at this idea that that anyone can be a designer and that stems from uh, a, a luminary in the design world, uh, a guy named Jared Spool. Uh, and he had this tweet where he said, everyone is a designer. Not everyone's a good designer, but everyone can be a better designer. And so I, I really take that to heart uh, because design is all about choices that we make in terms of what we're about to present to a user. Uh, and so even if you're not meaning to make choices, you're always making choices. So if you're a, a solo developer or if you are a... Uh, a developer that works with maybe a really, really small team, uh, it's on you to also be thinking good and positive design thoughts. Um, so we'll get into how you can be become a better designer. I'm going to talk about some tips and tricks throughout. Uh, but first, we mentioned this a little bit. Who am I? My name is Brian. You can find me on various social networks at B-R-O-B at B-R-O-B. Uh, you can also find my blog at brianlrobinson.com. And I did just start this company, Code Contemporary, doing developer education. Uh, and then as, as I've kind of mentioned, I think, uh, I'm also offering free design critiques uh, and a buddy of mine, James Quick, is offering free code reviews. Uh, and I set up a little website to kind of house all that. So peerreviews.dev, if you don't want a live critique, I understand, you can submit a form over there and I'll do a critique on YouTube for later. Uh, so just hit that up when you get a chance and see uh, the videos we put there. So let's go ahead and dive a little bit uh, into the grand world of design. Uh, and I have a degree in philosophy, if you're here at the beginning of the stream. Uh, and my favorite course in my entire degree was this philosophy of language uh, course. And the biggest thing that I've learned from that course that I've used every single day of my career is the fact that we can't have a meaningful discussion about any topic uh, without first getting on the same page about some definitions. So I always like to start a presentation by defining various terms that I'm going to use, but also terms in the industry. Um, so oftentimes when I present this as to like an actual like live in-person audience, I'd ask what they think design is, but we're going to skip the audience participation part. And I'm just going to go ahead and show this quote from Steve Jobs, 
um, who said that design is a funny word. Uh, some people think design means how something looks, right? So oftentimes when we talk about design, we talk about, you know, designers make things pretty. But if you dig deeper into that, really what design is, is defining how things work. And if you're, you know, a developer of any, of any length of time, you realize that we're doing that design work every single day. Um, but of course, there's more minutia than that in terms of design. And I like to kind of break up design into this, this idea of macro design and micro design. You don't have to worry about scanning all those words on the page. But overall, uh, macro design talks about big picture things, the usability of something, informational architecture, content strategy, the flow a user takes through a site, various personas that are our core users. Basically, everything that you can think of that doesn't involve pixels on the page, more often than not, is what I would consider macro design. Uh, and then we've got micro design, uh, which I define kind of as interaction design. So like the actual human computer interaction, uh, informational layout, visual design and interface design. So one of those terms that was on there uh, is, is vague enough that it gets used a lot. And I feel like sometimes it gets misused a little bit and usability sometimes starts taking the place of user experience and it starts getting into user interface. And it's, it's a much broader term than that. Uh, and there's a great definition uh, from the Nielsen Norman Group, which is one of the pioneers of usability and user experience, uh, especially on the web, but they've been around for decades and decades. Uh, and they define usability based on five criteria. Uh, the first is learnability. And what that means is it's how easy is it for a user to accomplish the most basic of tasks on your design the first time they come to it? So how easily can they suss out what they need to do? And then efficiency is once they've learned the design, once they've tackled that first hurdle, how quickly can they then perform the tasks that they've come to? How easily can they find information, add a new tweet, add a new post, that sort of thing. And then memorability means when a user has left your design, gone on with their lives, but then they come back to it after a long period of not using it, how easily can they reestablish proficiency with the design? So how easily can they go back and become efficient with it again? Uh, the fourth criteria is called errors, and it's the only negative criteria, but it means uh, a lot of different things, right? The most important thing is how many users does it, or how many errors does a user make? That's important because we don't want users to make errors. They'll bounce off first sight if they do. But also, how severe are the errors and how easily can they recover from them? So my favorite example of this criteria uh, is a form, right? And so let's say we have a, a, a standard form. It has four fields and we've marked some as required, but didn't tell the user that, right? There's no little asterisk next to it. A user is probably going to submit that form with some of those fields blank, come back to the form page. What do we do to help them recover from that error? So you, know, you put a red box around it, you highlight things, you make it as easy as possible to recover from it. Otherwise, they are gone in the next second. And then the last one's a little vague, it's a little touchy-feely. It's how pleasant is the, is the design to use? What's the user satisfaction? Much harder to measure. Uh, it's a little bit of a moving target. But basically, does the user enjoy using what you've got? So that's usability. Different from the user's experience, different from user interface. It is its own thing to talk about and be concerned with. Uh, and then information architecture gets tossed around a decent bit. Information architecture is one of my favorite topics because I'm not a particularly great visual designer. Uh, so I get to use information architecture to, uh, to be how I inform designs in the long run. Uh, so this is a definition from the uh, usability.gov website, which is actually a pretty good website uh, for learning a lot about UX. Uh, and it says information architecture, or IA, so you might be familiar with the, the abbreviation as well. It focuses on organizing, structuring, and labeling content in an effective and suitable way. Uh, so oftentimes this takes the place of a site or takes the form of a site map or a wireframe, right? Like let's figure out the user's flow through the site by organizing our information in the best way. Then when we get into the micro design side of things, we've got interaction design. Uh, and interaction designers strive to create meaningful relationships between people and products, right? So it is the, the actual interface, the actual um, interactions between the human and the product itself. So it's beyond just computers, it's mobile devices, it's appliances, it's buttons, it's all sorts of things that all kind of go together into this idea of interaction design. And then when we get past that, we move into interaction or interface design. And interface design is what you would consider UI. So oftentimes I hear people say, uh, we're concerned about the UX UI of this. Two separate concerns. 
UI is interface design. And really, it's the sum of all of those micro design pieces and the macro design pieces together. So information architecture is going to define our structure. The interaction design shows people how to manipulate what they're getting. And then the visual design communicates these possibilities to people. So the user interface is the sum of all the parts of these kind of micro and macro design pieces. But you probably don't care about, about the definitions, right? You just want to know how to make your designs better, whether or not you've got a designer sitting next to you. So I've got a, a few guidelines for how to make your design better. Because as I stated at the beginning, we are all designers. We might not be good designers all the time, but we can all be better, according to Jared's school. Uh, and I, de I define two different sets of design guidelines. First is how we handle our informational layout. And the second is how we handle aesthetic judgments. You probably think of design as handling the, just the aesthetic judgments, but we're going to talk about informational layout first. And the most important topic when it comes to informational layout is the use of white space. If you've never heard the term, it doesn't literally mean white color on the page. It is oftentimes also referred to as negative space. It's really the area around content that lets the user kind of breathe around it. Uh, oftentimes, white space is conflated with air. We need to space this out, give it more air, give it more breathing space. It's all kind of this airy uh, notation. But let's take a look at the bad. And like I said in the, the pre-stream or the beginning of the stream, I like to level uh, some fun at the New York Times a little bit. This is an older version of the design at this point. They've gone through some iterations. Uh, but they don't do a good job of dealing with white space. They cram as much as they can into as small an area as possible. Uh, and that kind of dates back to, if you look at the New York Times paper from like the early 1900s, it is the hardest thing ever to look at with a modern sensibility. But you can see everything's kind of crammed in. Everything is as much uh, information as high up as possible. So if you kind of conflate that with the medium design, this is the medium design from the same era. And nowadays, I, I wish I had a better example of this. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of medium anymore. Uh, but they do a great job of illustrating why white space is so important. They have a, a right-hand sidebar, uh, which is a little bit cluttered. But the left-hand side makes it super easy to scan through the page and see where one item ends and the next one begins. And as we all know on the web, right? No one reads anymore. Everyone just kind of scans to find the information they're looking for. So the better scannability you've got on your site, the more interactions you'll get from a person reading through it. So Medium uses white space, even to this day, to delineate where one item ends and the next one begins. And it helps users scan the page much, much easier. So another trip to Badville with white space uh, is this open forum website. Uh, and you'll notice at the top, things appear to be pretty good, right? We've got a decent bit of space around our headline. You can kind of, the contrast isn't great in the colors, but you can tell what's going on. They have a big, bold subhead coming up next. The issue occurs when we scroll down the page a little bit and we look at the paragraphs line height and we look at the spacing between those paragraphs. It's really, really hard to tell where one paragraph ends and the next begins. The, the spacing between our paragraphs is almost the exact same height as the line height between each of the lines of text. And so again, to kind of go back to an older uh, medium design, they do a much, much better job of this. And we'll scroll down the page a little bit. You can see there's a decent bit of space between the, the banner and the paragraphs. But then each paragraph is set off with a lot of white space, a lot of margin across the bottom that lets you know where it ends and begins. They still have great line height. They still have a big font. But it flows much, much better. And it's going to be a much easier experience for a user to have. So that's white space. There's also an idea that I like to talk about as grouping. And it's this idea that when you put items next to each other, they connote relationships, right? Whether that's an implied relationship that you as a developer or designer gives to the user, or if it's a relationship that the user is just inferring from our design, it's important either way. And things that are close together and grouped have connection whether you want them to or not. So let's take a look at an example of that. This is my favorite slide, bar none. Uh, and it has two photos, a caption that says, this guy has a complicated relationship with hot dogs. Now, on the left-hand side, the white space between this, the grouping, is that all three of these things are tied together. 
right? The top guy and the bottom guy have a complicated relationship with hot dogs. But on the right-hand side, by just manipulating a little bit of white space, we tie that caption with the man at the top. We kind of understand that the person down below has given up on life after consuming too many hot dogs. That's not complicated. He ate too many hot dogs. The one at the top, I'm not so sure about. So a more serious example uh, would be this blog layout. And it's grouping things in multiple ways, using white space, using color, using all sorts of tools in the design toolbox, right? So first and foremost, we have a headline and a subhead, and they're grouped together at the top with a separator beneath them, that little filigree and uh, yellow gold line. And then beneath that, we get meta information about the blog post itself. It's written by an author. There's a little bit of bio about the author. And then down below that, we have the social media shareable functionality. Again, meta information. And then set off by a lot of white space and also that kind of different coloration, we get the body of the story. So this allows a user to know, if I don't care about the title and the byline and all that, I can skip right past it and very quickly find the first paragraph of the body of the story. And then again, a slightly older design, we've got the old iOS Twitter app. Uh, I think that Twitter's always done a pretty decent job, whether or not you like other pieces of the functionality on the Twitter app, modern and slightly older. Uh, I think they do a great job of grouping things. And so I like to talk about the fact that uh, here at the top, we have the blue bar sectioning off system-wide controls. We move in next to an author card. So we've got my photo, uh, my name, and my, uh, my handle all grouped together. And then with a little bit of white space underneath, we separate that just a little bit from the body of the post. And then we section off everything else with hard rules, right? So after that, we get our, our actions, which are, you know, reply, retweet, the star, which used to be the heart, or uh, um, was the old version of the heart, which I still miss because I like the star. Um, and so we get these actions, and they're separated out by, again, this kind of hard rule. And then we move into the responses, which get extra separated by the fact that they've got the image, and then they also have a slightly different background color. So you can see we can use color, we can use size, we can use all sorts of stuff to give this grouping functionality. And I like to give a concrete example of that, right? And we call this, this technique giving visual hierarchy. And you, uh, anytime I do a critique, I'm almost always talking about visual hierarchy as one of the number one uh, things that you can improve. And we do that via size, color, weight, and that white space layout to create a different visual flow for users throughout the content. So let's take a look at a blog post. This is my most amazing blog post right here. It's called Hello There World. It has a little subhead, has a byline, and has my first paragraph of text. And you can't really tell the difference between any of them. You have to read to know what's going on here. Uh, and so the very first thing that I like to talk about with visual hierarchy is adjusting size will let users know what each one is supposed to do. So we very, very simply adjust the size on our headline, our subhead, and our byline. And it denotes and connotes importance to these items. And it gives a user a clear flow through what we need them to read. I've adjusted very little else other than that. So we very obviously have a headline. We very obviously have a subhead. The byline is a little bit smaller than the body text. And that's because really, I hate to break it to like the egoists out there like myself. No one cares if you wrote it. They just care about the content. So we always kind of downplay that a little bit and tie it together a little bit with the, uh, the article body, at least in the way I like to design out blog posts. And then we can use color to section things out even harder, and we can put a background color or maybe a banner image behind our title, our, our headline, and our subhead. And we can also adjust that subhead color uh, to be a light gray on that, which is going to be not quite as contrasty, which also lowers the importance. So we get to still have a large font size, which people expect from a subhead, but we lower the visual weight of it just a little bit by lowering the contrast. So our title is the biggest font on the page. It's also the most contrast on the page. Uh, and then we let our subhead fade into the background just a little bit. And you'll also notice that I've lowered the, uh, the font color on the byline as well. Again, lowering that importance, lowering the visual hierarchy of that piece uh, just a little bit further so people can scan right past it and get into the body. And then we can also take style into, into account. We can change fonts to also separate these pieces, right? So the only change between the last one and this one is we've taken our headline and we've moved it from a sans serif font to a serif font. And we've also made our byline in italics. 
the italics are actually going to lower the visual weight of that item a little bit further. So I'm all about taking my ego out of it, even though I really love when people read my blog posts. Uh, and then we also, the, the visual weight of a sans serif, or of a serif font is always going to be a little bit heavier than a sans serif font. So we, uh, again, add to the weight of it uh, by doing that. And then if we wanted to completely restructure the way a user would think about the headline and subhead, we can use layout to really downplay that subhead. And maybe this becomes an abstract for our article. So just by moving it from being the next thing following vertically from our headline and shifting it over to the right hand side of the screen, whereas in, uh, in Western society, right, we read left to right. So we end up seeing hello there, beautiful world, and maybe even ignoring the, uh, the subhead over there on the right hand side. Again, it's all about dealing with the various weights and telling your user what is the most important thing for them to read next. And we let that right hand side kind of flow much, much further into the background because uh, we want to get users directly into our blog post if that's our intent. If we want them to read the subhead, then we go vertically. So there's a lot of wiggle room and playing that you can do depending on what you want to emphasize and where you want your user's eye to go next. So I also like to talk about rule of thirds a little bit in this, and that is an old school theory of design. It stems from the age of art and, and photography, and it states simply that you set up thirds vertically and horizontally, and you put your most important things along the intersection of those axes. So here we've got uh, the, again, slightly old school smashing magazine website design. And you can see at the top of the page, the first axis, or the first intersection, right, falls on the headline and byline of the article. So it allows a user to jump down the page a little bit. But if you go to the right-hand side, they've cleverly put their advertisements along that second intersection point. And then the very next intersection point at the bottom left is the first paragraph. So again, leading the eye via a uh, um, uh, this kind of rule of thirds that we've kind of, whether or not it is ingrained in us biologically is way up for debate. There's been a lot of studies done both ways on that, but we've ingrained this in our design patterns overall, which means that nowadays rule of thirds is actually a big rule of thought in the way we look at things. And here's another example. We put the child's face directly on one of those intersections. So we're getting an emotional appeal there. And then two of the three other intersections are two calls to action. Take a look at the Google Ventures layout. The headline takes up both of the first two uh, intersections. And then their kind of calls to action down beneath what we've been up to uh, are right underneath that, taking up the next two intersection points. So rule of thirds, whether or not you believe the science and the, and the uh, biological imperative behind it, which is questionable at best, has been so ingrained into the way that we do design that at this point, it pretty much is uh, the rule of the land. So those are kind of my, my ideas around informational layout, right? Hit the rule of thirds, uh, definitely check your white space. White space is the most important, but also deal with visual hierarchy, have various weights that you give a user via color, size, typography, et cetera. So let's talk about aesthetic judgment a little bit. And so the very first thing that is probably the hardest thing to talk about in aesthetic judgment for a lot of people who don't consider themselves designers uh, is this idea of color choices, right? Colors are hard. Uh, mixing and matching colors is hard. Uh, I am by no means great at doing color. I'm kind of a hybrid. I do a lot of design and development. Uh, color is probably my weakest area. So I stick to a pretty simple rule of thumb with this. That stick to neutrals, whether that is black and white, grays, light beiges, neutral colors, and then have one hard pop of color that allows you to have calls to action and that sort of thing. So play with neutrals and then have one color. But don't just pick a color willy nilly. There's been a lot of discussion around color psychology and color theory uh, in terms of how you can uh, present your brand uh, for whatever you're working on. And some of them are a little bit in terms of like their older school methodologies, uh, but they are now again associated with so much emotion now that they fall into place along roughly the lines on this slide. This is actually one of my favorite uh, ways of showing color psychology. Uh, you can see like red is a very active, exciting, powerful color. Uh, it oftentimes is somewhat youthful and exciting. So you can see companies like Red Bull, Nintendo, uh, Coca-Cola all trying to hit that youthful, energetic feel. 
Uh, you've got stuff like navy being one of the colors of business because it definitely has a trustworthy quality to it. It's responsible. It's a little bit more upright. Green talks about nature a lot, but it also can talk about money. My favorite brand on the slide is actually the BP logo. Uh, BP's color is green, even though it is just not environmentally friendly whatsoever, but they want you to, to kind of infer a relationship with nature to them. It, it benefits them for people to see them in that light. Uh, you can see like, you know, purple is deep, it's stimulating, it's creative. Uh, there's actually been a big resurgence in purple color on the web. You see purple all over the place more and more. And that's that creativity that we're trying to push for uh, in web design nowadays. Uh, and then you can always take a look at color charts and play around with various color theories out there on the web. Um, so you can see if, if you kind of look to this kind of color chart and pick opposites. Opposites are almost always going to be of a high contrast and really allow you to kind of pop colors off the page. But you can also take something like, uh, it used to be called cooler.adobe.com, that'll still work. Um, and you can find different design patterns that you can utilize that follow the various points of color theory and color design. And pick, again, a couple neutrals, one pop of color and you're good to go. These are actually color palettes I used to use on my website. I still to this day use them. I've adjusted them to have uh, a brighter orange, that palette at the bottom. There's a lot of reading out there. Uh, I'll see if I can get these uploaded somewhere so that uh, Kevin can share it out and you can go take a look at these, but there are just a few different, uh, um, few different resources out there for kind of continuing. But nowadays color is actually sometimes less important than typography. Uh, and you can see that we kind of, I talked about on the slide, font choices are super important nowadays because we can now utilize so many non-standard fonts. You know, the, the days of uh, just having the five basic fonts are, are at an end. Uh, so it's time to start experimenting. And again, I have a rule of thumb about this. You have one regular font, one for your body copy. I recommend the sans serif font, not a serif font. Uh, for that, it's a little bit easier to read overall. Uh, but then you have, a, an accent font, just like you've got an accent color, utilize it for headlines. So I like to think of a good accent font as a serif font, uh, but a slab font, which is, you know, those thick, bold display fonts work pretty well as well. And you can use those terms on like fonts.google.com to find out something that's going to match your brand a little bit. For the most part, I usually recommend staying away from uh, like grungy fonts or handwriting fonts as they get very, very difficult to read at various sizes. So sticking to a slab or a serif is always going to be a good way of choosing an accent font without losing readability. And again, fonts can, can kind of connote uh, um, various things about your brand as well. Serif fonts tend to have a high level of tradition. They are the font of print. So they do carry this kind of timeless tradition and feel. They're very, very respectable, reliable, uh, Georgia italic being a comfortable font up there. Sans serif fonts on the web tend to be slightly easier to read, uh, but they also uh, definitely show off a clean, modern style. Although nowadays with, uh, with our high DPI screens, serif fonts can also play a role in that as well. And then you can see like friendly fonts, again, staying away from script and display is probably a great idea uh, unless you really, really know what you're doing. Uh, Cause those fonts also have a tendency to not have great line heights built into them. So they become a real uh, pain to use in a lot of ways. Uh, and then we can also utilize shape and symmetry to, uh, to give various meaning without actually using words on the page. So I love this, uh, this image blatantly stolen from that URL that shows a whole bunch of different shapes and what they kind of give the user in terms of emotion or feeling. And so you can see, um, you know, you've got kind of the lightning bolt at the top left. Uh, it's an active feeling. So again, it kind of connotes that electricity. Um, a static uh, horizontal line is going to give you a passive feeling. Uh, where's some of my other favorites on here? You've got, you know, a, a rising curve is going to give, you know, an optimistic feeling, whereas a descending curve is going to give a pessimistic feeling. A uh, curve that's kind of static uh, at the top left there is stable versus unstable. There's a lot of things we can do to allow for a user to get a, a feeling about our design without uh, using words. Because uh, we can give them that instant recognition that this is positive or this is negative or this is exciting. That's always going to be better than saying, hey, our product is super exciting. You should use it. 
but we can also use shape and symmetry to, to give various meanings. This is one of my favorite old portfolio sites uh, from somebody who's very much like me, a designer and a developer, and it shows that these two sides of his personality are equal, right? He's a designer, a coder, that's what these two things mean, that's what these two things imply, and they give equal weight because they are next to each other. There's also an old uh, recruiter, vitamin T. You could have uh, the fact that they had two user groups. I'm looking for talent. I'm looking for work. Both of equal importance to a recruiter. You can't find jobs for people if you don't have jobs to show them and you can't you know, get jobs without people. And so vice versa, you put these two things next to each other, give them the exact same visual weight, give them the exact same placement, and you allow them to feel very, very equal. And then a couple, uh, a couple other kind of tips and tricks that I've got. My favorite of which is the squint test. Uh, this is all about visual hierarchy at its finest. So if you can look at your design and squint your eyes up really, really tight, right? So you can barely see the screen or if you've got horrible vision like me, just take off your glasses and you can kind of figure out the hierarchy of the page, you've done visual hierarchy uh, pretty well. You've done it at least well enough to, uh, to put it live. Uh, always provide a next step. This is kind of a macro design piece always make sure there's a call to action. So whether that's on your homepage in your banner, you wanna have a link to go buy a product, learn more about a product, or whether that's reading an article and giving a user another article to read or something else that they can do, it's very, very important. Um, the Noun Project is one of my favorite tools. Uh, it gives you unlimited um, icons for, I think it's still $10 a month. It is totally worth your time. Uh, there are places to get free icons, free you know vector images, they're not always gonna be as high quality as the Noun Project puts out on a regular basis. Subtle Patterns is a really cool place to get background patterns. Background patterns will give you a lot of warmth to your website without adding color to it. Uh, so you can use that to, to kind of warm things up. Um, I said this on lots of different streams, lots of different presentations, don't use rotators, don't use carousels. Uh, it's been proven that they don't do anything good to your conversion rates, so just don't use them. Always convince uh, a stakeholder that they are a bad plan. Uh, and then be careful with standard wisdom or standard conventions. So I hear a lot of times when you're talking about e-commerce, well, Amazon does X, right? Just because Amazon does X does not mean that it will work for you. Uh, so look to the big players, but don't copy them because they have different design constraints. They also have different users than you potentially do. It's one thing to, to have a small e-commerce shop with 100 products. It's another to have one with millions. And then just to illustrate, to be careful with convention, uh, everyone who's probably watching the screen knows what that icon in the top right is, right? It's a hamburger menu for mobile. But as it turns out, hamburger menus on mobile don't perform very well. And there's a study uh, done, and there've been other studies done as well uh, from that, that link there uh, on the Caffeine Informer website. You can tell that this is a slightly older study by the, uh, the Chrome in our Safari window there. Uh, but he tested, uh, hamburger icon in a bordered box, the word menu in a bordered box, menu and the icon and an unbordered menu word. And as it turns out, the hamburger menu and the word menu on its own with no border failed the test. People didn't know to click on it to get to their, uh, their menu. So the word menu inside of a bordered box and the word menu with the hamburger icon did the best, they performed the best and again, this is this was a um, like I think it was about fifty thousand. You could do the math there. About fifty thousand users uh, testing this conversion rate. The word menu without the border, I would not have assumed would have been the worst, uh, but it was the worst, and that's because it didn't feel active. It didn't feel like something that you could do to click on. Uh, the baseline with just the hamburger uh, did not perform well at all. It did do better with the word menu. Uh, the word menu with the hamburger and the word menu with the border are the two that perform the best, but head and shoulders above it all was the word menu. And that's just to show that convention saying, oh, everyone knows what the hamburger menu is, doesn't necessarily mean that everyone that uses your application will. Uh, so how do you get better? Uh, for me, there's a lot of people you can follow. Uh, these are just a handful. Brad Frost is an amazing guy to look at, especially for design systems nowadays. He's done a lot of work on that. Luke Wroblewski was one of the forefathers of talking about responsive design and dealing with forms, especially responsive, which is very, very cool. 
Yuna Kravitz is an absolutely amazing designer and developer. Uh, she's at Google now. She wasn't uh, not too long ago, but she is amazing and posts a lot of great content. And then I mentioned Jared Spool at the beginning. Uh, he's very, very important in the usability field. Uh, so overall, um, that's that's what I've kind of got as a presentation. But I do want to, if it's been posted in chat, which I can't see right now, uh, do a critique for someone because I do think it's important to see concrete examples of what I'm talking about in the presentation. And as I as I kind of alluded to before, uh, let me close out of my email. Uh, I do have a backup, but I would love Kevin if there is somebody that wants one to give it to somebody. Well, I've been posting like a madman trying to get them <laughs> for you, and. I don't have any takers at the moment, so let's okay. Give we it will another, go. Yeah, uh, we'll go to backup like strats. A minute or two. Go ahead and do your backup because I think that's a safe bet. All right, let me let me drag it on up here. Uh, so this was actually submitted, and it's actually a video that's going to go live either later this week or next week for the full critique, right? Uh, but this was submitted from uh, peerreviews.dev. Uh, which is the project that I'm running with my friend James Quick. Uh, and it's just a, somebody's blog, right? They submitted it and I'm doing a review of it. Uh, but this is one of like, it's kind of a nice looking design, right? Let me actually minimize this a little bit because it's not great at a incredibly wide side size, but it does give me the ability to talk about macro design versus micro design a little bit, uh, which I don't talk about in the, in the video that's coming out. Uh, but the very first thing that I like to talk about with macro design is the fact that we have this sidebar over here, which actually on the homepage serves no purpose. Uh, it shows recent articles and it shows tags, which uh, he doesn't quite have enough posts to, uh, to go into those tags yet and year, right? So these, these are these are pieces of functionality that maybe in the future will be super helpful, but aren't right now. So I, I, I do like to talk about he could take up that room, that right-hand column, and get four, uh, four uh, grid cells across and get a little bit more data density out of it. But I really, really enjoy uh, the use of color on this, uh, just because it does give a little bit of a visual hierarchy down below. Uh, and I really like that, that he's done a logo, right? It's a very simple logo. It gives a connotation that this is the web. It is uh, Corey J A colon slash slash, right? Which is a protocol. So if you're a developer coming to it, you kind of get the idea. This is all about the web, which is great. Uh, I, I do uh, wish that he kind of lined things up a little bit better and didn't have these descend quite so low into it. Uh, so that, that gives him kind of something to, just to tweak to tighten up that spacing, give a hard line, because the hard lines are actually uh, very, very helpful. But I really enjoy this kind of multicolored border down here. And it also lines up with the borders that he's got down here in the card view, which is really, really nice. I think that's a nice color match that lets everyone know that this is a, a, a thought out system. I like a lot of the, uh, the uh, visual white space that he's got going on. Although one issue that I do have with that is we have this white space right here. This is technically gray space, right? Negative space between uh, the blog title here and these next two areas. But the right-hand sidebar has additional white space between uh, the blog posts and it. And so I, I tend to like to have even spacing whenever I can. So you've got uh, whatever that is, probably about, I guess, 20 pixels of space uh, between the top and the bottom. And then we're talking probably about 40 pixels of space here on the right-hand side. So I would even that out. You, you could either take the additional space and give it to the left-hand side, make the right-hand side feel a little uh, less tight. And then talking about some very, very micro things that he can do to improve, uh, you can see here with uh, this dev icon lookup, uh, this is what we call a tangent in, in design. When things either don't touch or just barely touch, uh, that's usually kind of a mistake feeling. And all that's happening here is that he's depending on text line center to, uh, to kind of give the padding that he needs. And so very, very easily, he could come in here, add about 10 pixels of padding, and never get that uncomfortable space. We always want to keep things as spaced out as possible. Uh, and then my favorite thing to talk about in terms of interaction design uh, is giving enough clickable space and clickable areas for the user never to have to guess what's clickable and what's not. So right now, on each of his blog posts, the title and the more link both click into the article but these tags click off to a tag page. And so my recommendation overall is make this entire colored block a clickable space. It allows for a user to click anywhere and never miss the target because missing targets is an incredibly frustrating experience for a user. And to think that maybe I can click here and get the blog post, I'd be pretty frustrated to come to a tag page at that point. So it's very important to always make it as clear as possible what things are going to do. And for a blog post, I love just linking the entire thing over uh, to a blog page. 
And then if we take a look at the blog pages themselves, I like the, the cleanness of the design. Um, again, I would focus on having this, uh, this gray space in between uh, kind of be a little tighter. Uh, but I actually like having the sidebar on these pages because it gives you next steps, right? I talked about that. Always have a next step available to the user. It's, it's kind of a built-in next step. If you like this blog post, here's some others. Uh, I like that he's got a decent bit of visual spacing uh, between each of his paragraphs, right? So I can very easily tell where one paragraph ends and the next one begins. Um, I, I wish kind of we could get rid of the blog title here. Uh, I think it's a little not obvious since this entire thing is a blog. I'd love to get rid of that and move the entire space up because uh, the, the visual weight of this red area is a little bit bigger. It's a little bit stronger than the blog title, but only by a little bit, right? And so it's not giving a user that kind of immediate satisfaction of knowing they landed on this specific blog post. Uh, and then I, I fully um, agree with downplaying the, uh, the article um, date, right? When, when the actual article came out, it's important to have in any sort of developer, developer uh, resource just because this could be outdated six months from now. So knowing that it came out in February of this year uh, is very helpful, but it is not the most important thing. So moving it out of the way is a great idea. Uh, and then coming down, we've got you know code blocks that all works out. I think they're a little heavy on the weight. I'd love for a different um, coloration to happen here, maybe a slightly lighter uh, gray than what he's got, uh, just because it takes you out of the flow of reading a little bit stronger than what I'd like. Uh, but overall, I like a lot of what's going on. Uh, let's come on all the way down to the bottom. We do have uh, kind of other next steps down here, the ability to go previous and next on the articles, which is super nice. I might give a little bit more visual weight and a little more separation uh, between each of these. So give the tags uh, a big margin on the bottom so that it's obvious that they're pushed away from the, uh, the, the tags, you know, so that the articles are much further down. Uh, and then I like that he's moved his um, his bio and that sort of thing down below. Because again, if you take your ego out of the equation, it's important to have your your byline on there somewhere. It's important to have, you know, bio information, but it is not the most important thing on the uh, on the site. And then one thing that I find a lot on developer websites uh, is this fact that if, if you see on the screen, like I really want to scroll down more. And that's because there's a lack of footer and there's not quite enough space at the bottom of the page. Uh, there's not quite enough room to make me know that the page has ended. And so for me, I always like adding a very, very uh, thin uh, um, footer on your site. So a darker color. So take like this gray and like darken it by, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 degrees, put a copyright in it, make sure that like people know this is your stuff. Uh, and that gives a sense of finality to the page. Uh, I talk a lot about energy in design and you don't want your energy to leak out. And so if you don't end on like a darker finish, oftentimes people feel like there's more to be seen down below. And then over on the right-hand side, uh, just to give a little bit of feedback here, uh, the indentation is not my favorite thing here. I'd love to see that uh, give a hard line here. It does connote that these fall under the recent articles, but I think that the line does that well enough on its own. Uh, and then I would give a little bit more vertical spacing in between each of these, just so that it's perfectly obvious where one headline ends and the next begins. Because we start getting into these, and I don't think there's quite enough space between them to let a user know that this is not the same article. Same with the tags and, and the years. Uh, and then I would also take a look at the uh, horizontal spacing on these social icons, right? Because if I get to this on a tablet, let's see what happens when we get down there. Uh, I might find myself in a place where I have to use my thumb. And I have a nice thin thumb. I don't know if you can see that in the tiny kind of view, but not everyone has a lovely thin thumb like I do. Uh, and so I might be going to click on his dev.2 profile and I might go over to his GitHub profile and then never ever go back. And so it, you need to have a lot of spacing around these icons. So I would give it a, an additional like 15 pixels uh, on either side of these icons. A good rule of thumb for a thumb is that you wanna look at about 45 to like 60 pixels of affordance around an icon to give it enough clickable space without running into another one. And then we'll take a quick look at mobile real fast. Uh, obviously, we've got some headline issues there. Uh, it should just be an easy fix. Uh, but you can see we start getting tight here. I'd love to see these kind of break onto a separate line uh, a little bit further down the page. But again, I still really enjoy the color scheme. Adding some padding down here would make it very, very uh, useful. And I actually like kind of the way that this recent articles goes. I would just, again, add a little bit more spacing in between each one. 
Um, so yeah, so I mean, overall, there's just so many little things that you can do that add up. So this is a really nice looking design and at a glance, I like it a lot, but no design is perfect. And so I always like to try to find little pieces here and there uh, that can improve any design. Even if you pull up a website and you think it's the most beautiful design ever, I guarantee you I can find at least one little thing that could make it better. And I think that's an important thing to never be quite satisfied with. So what do you think, Kevin? Any, any questions in the audience? Uh, I'm double checking. <laughs> uh, nothing. I've been, I've been trying, I've been seeing the chat and we had a good number of viewers today. So <laughs> is everyone's listening in the background? Okay. That's uh, fair. Jonathan, Jonathan says that was great. Uh, <laughs> awesome. I, I, I like positive feedback as much as the next person. Yeah. Um, I will throw this out there. Uh, just peerreviews.dev. It's a completely free service that my friend and I are running and we're just doing YouTube videos. Basically it helps us have content. It'll hopefully help people, you know, learn a little bit about design and development. Uh, his, his code reviews are great. We're also doing resume reviews. Um, and I'm doing obviously design critiques. So uh, I, awesome. I love for people to check that out and, and submit if they don't necessarily want to just hear it now. Awesome. Yeah. I know James, uh, from, uh, Coder Cruise. <laughs> we, yeah. were, we were co-speakers So Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so we'll give it a second for any last minute questions that might pop up. Sure. Um, let me stop my screen share so we can go back to our beautiful faces. <laughs> if not, we'll just go ahead and stop it here and we'll, we'll post information in, in the after video. Sure. Um, so yeah, the chat is, chat is pretty pretty quiet there's there's 22 quiet. people watching right now aren't there it's all right yeah Pretty well long. 25 total across all different platforms so it's a good number um all right well with that we'll we'll go and stop here and then we'll move on to the after show oh there's an after show excellent uh, um so thank you everyone for joining us and catch us next time on the swift kick show thanks brian so much for joining us thank you very much all right. And all right. Recording's done. So this is now the after show. After show. <laughs> um, I have no better way of labeling it. So <laughs> pre-show, show, and after show. Yep. Um, that was really good. Uh, I was making, I was trying to make comments in the chat. It's like, this is one of the few talks that I'm just going to bookmark and come back to whenever I'm starting a new project <laughs> just to make sure that I'm, I'm getting, um, I'm doing everything the right way. I love talks like this because I, I, instantly see all the problems with my projects is like yeah, yeah oh and and overall i'm like i'm a mediocre designer like i'm a hybrid right i do design development so like neither of those are great uh but i love talking about like tweaks tweaks are my favorite thing to do because yeah. they can be so powerful that's i've i've relied so much in my career on different frameworks like i remember when bootstrap came out it was like the greatest thing ever because you didn't have to worry about any of these details you just yeah. start writing code it's like well you know what it's good enough <laughs> and but my favorite thing on bootstrap right is that if you don't utilize bootstrap properly you'll run into some of these issues like visual spacing exactly. and hierarchy if you're not using the right classes or like organizing your content properly yep yeah but no like bootstrap revolutionized a lot i want us to push away from bootstrap now like yeah i want to see new cool designs um but Bootstrap serves a great purpose. My favorite quote about it, though, was uh, um, frameworks work great for the people who created the framework. So, yeah. like, Bootstrap was amazing for Twitter. It was great for everyone else, but, like, they solved their design problems. Yep. And they gave us a lot of cool tools, too. Yeah. it's uh, I got a project I'm working on right now. We're using... Um material design so mm -hmm. we're using uh beautify to to bring everything in and it's like exactly your point if you don't use the classes in the right order or the right hier hierarchy it's like things are just not going to work the way you expect them to i, and, I did a, um, a youtube series on um converting a, a bootstrap theme to a, a static site generator theme like right just taking yeah. a static html one and i had to fight myself because i wanted to make all these design tweaks because i didn't utilize some of the things quite right but i was like no not the part of the video. Gotta just stick to the static way that they did it. Yep. So using uh, Material, I mentioned uh, Una Kravitz. She's actually the uh, dev dev evangelist for Material now. So she's, oh, nice. Uh, that's that's what she's doing at Google. Um, I've I've kind of fallen in love with it just uh, because it's one of those things. I call them. Uh, 
they're a little effort, but they can make you a million dollars. It's like yeah. to, to the point, like I'll go, I'll go into a client review and have done no work other than just a scaffold yep. um, and say, all right, here's what we're working with. They're like, this looks amazing. How I'm like, you you're, fast? you've been working on this forever. It's like, you've done so much work. I'm like, cool. Here's my bill. Yep. <laughs> and a hundred uh, hours. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just nice because they like my needs, um, like just simple CRUD applications is kind of what these are. It's like CRUD plus plus. Mm -hmm. Um, you just need a little bit more functionality over basic CRUD design Mm -hmm. and just go through, build out these apps in material and they do the job good enough. And then, then I can go back and make subtle tweaks where I, where I need to, like you were touching on, it's like, all right, let's just get something and then let's go back and incrementally improve upon it. Yep. Um, yeah, and I, I like material, especially for like the crud, the crud design stuff that they do is great. Like it's it's one yeah. of my it's my favorite framework for that sort of design for for app de- especially app stuff. Like they're great for 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 that. Yeah, I have a friend in a Slack who's been playing with um, all these other CSS frameworks out there, and he's been trying to find one so he can rebuild his uh, static marketing site on it. And it's like, man, just just build the site. <laughs> so yeah. just go. Um, don't spend all this time just looking at CSS frameworks. Although it's a fun exercise just to see what's out there and what's available. Like my, my least favorite thing on, on frameworks for, for the front end in, in that way uh, is actually the fact that if you're not careful, they'll have to influence your HTML. And yeah. like, so if you, if you build out your HTML properly, it's decently accessible. It's really like bare bones you end up gunking it up with a lot of frameworks. Like, oh, well, I need this container, this container, this container, when you didn't really, but you had to do it for the framework, so. Yep, yeah, I know that all too well too. But it's so much better nowadays. I I reminisce on my first web app I built back in 2007. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was working, uh, the company I worked for, we had development team and we had the design team. So I was working with the lead designer on the project and she's designing a website. Like before that was a thing, like web designer was, it wasn't a thing yet. So her, her background was in like print design Mm -hmm. and like she gave me some of these mockups and they look beautiful. It's like, wow, that looks really good. Holy crap. I have to turn that into HTML CSS with a little bit of JavaScript. And uh, again, 2007, it's like before JavaScript did anything useful. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we had jQuery. That was it. it was like, that was the jQuery only thing. was great. I love jQuery. <laughs> so I remember going in and taking, she had s- sliced up all these images and I'm trying to put them in the right place. And she would come back and be like, that's not in the right place. You need to, you need to add like three pixels. I'm like three pixels. Oh my gosh. It's like, uh, there's no physical way for me to do this. So I'm adding one pixel like buffer um, transparent images. Spacer gifts. I love spacer yeah. gifts. It's like, da, 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 da. it's like, how's this look? Oh, that looks great. Cool. It only works on IE. Like, no, you can't use it on anything else. No, I'm not supporting any other browser on the face of the planet. Yep. It's only on IE. And I'm so my, glad we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> my, my favorite thing was uh, uh, going from ta- from a company that did table layout, right? That was like the, the way mm-hmm. that it happened to yep. a company that didn't. And they gave me my first project, which was converting their blogs from movable type to WordPress, right? And like this would have been 2007-ish. Yeah, so around yep. that same time. And I had no clue what I was doing with CSS, like just none. And so like I started moving it and I was using like this combination platter of CSS and tables I, I got confused. I had this one little issue, kind of like what you're talking about. Like, here's like five pixels off. And it wasn't, yeah. I didn't want to resort to space or gifts. So I went over to like the creative director. I was like, I have no clue. Like, what, what have I done wrong? And he was like, well, I'll take a look at it. I'll come back to you. And uh, he came to, over to my desk about an hour later. He's like, what have you done? Like, th- <laughs> I don't even understand what's happening in this code. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. All right, cool. And so like, then I did like my deep dive on everything. Kind of picked all that up. But like, making that migration was rough. Oh, sounds rough. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Don't miss that at all. So yeah. I feel uh, folks coming into tech nowadays, they just don't understand. <laughs> like, These kids, man. Say, oh yeah, it's program is great. Everyone should be a programmer. It's like, yes, because everyone can be a programmer now. Mm-hmm. Like 
10 years, 10 years ago, uh, what, 12, 13 years ago? No, not everyone could be a developer because yep. it was hard. It like was, it was really hard. We have, and, and not hard in the fun way either. Like no, hard in the super frustrating way. Like now it's hard in, in the fun way, like challenges and questions and all that. But uh, yeah. Yep. Oh my gosh. Space uh, I, I don't space. want to think about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, that was so painful. Maybe that's why, you know, some of us developers who have, you know, been around the block enough times were just so like, oh, <laughs> I mean, you all, so all do this work. I, I don't want to do it anymore. I have a presentation called uh, Postmodern CSS, and it's one of my favorite presentations to give. And uh, the very the first like 10 minutes of it is the history of CSS in like eras. And, and I refer to that era as the Middle Ages. It's the Dark Ages. And that's the reason that people hate CSS. Because yep. modern CSS is beautiful. It's super easy to use. But if you're dealing with floats and tables, yep. no thank you. Like I don't even like I used to do that for a living and I had to deal with IE6, right? Like that was, yeah. I got so good at IE6, like because I broke it so many times, but yeah. like no one has to deal with it anymore. And it's a beautiful thing. And it made that skill set completely obsolete. Oh man, I, I, that's why I'm so bitter is I had to do old school CSS. Mm -hmm. And it's why I, I do not have an appreciation for new CSS is why I lean so much on frameworks is because I had to do it the hard way. And I remember like, I will approach a problem now. It's like, I have no idea how to solve this problem. Well, and like, <laughs> so floats, right? Like the number one way of doing any sort of layout on the web in, you know, 2007 to, you know, 2012, we're never meant to do the things that we were told to do. Yep. Like they were meant to yeah. take an image and wrap text around it. Yep. That's it. And so that's why like flex and grid, like it lets floats be their own thing that do exactly what they were always intended to do. Yeah. Uh, but like uh, CSS 2 and 2.1 went back and forth so much and had so many differences that the browsers implemented in weird ways. That's where that's where all the hatred comes out in for like IE6 and IE7. But the spec went back and forth. Like that's why there's two and then two revision one. <laughs> but yeah, like I, I get when developers hate CSS. But like, it's not too, it's not the two point one era anymore. CSS three no. is awesome, and there won't be a CSS four. It's great. <sighs> All right. So on that note, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show. No problem. I loved it. It was, it was fun. This will be live, live on YouTube uh, on Monday ish, Monday Tuesday. Cool. Um, and I will see you at KCDC. Definitely. Awesome. So if anyone watching, go to KCDC, Kansas City Developer Conference. You can do a whole workshop with me, full half day. It'll be great. Man, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to come sit in the workshops. I'm I'm fine in Tuesday just so I can have a couple of free days. Yeah. Uh, my talk's on until Friday. So I'm just... Nice thing for me is I fly in Tuesday. I'm done by Wednesday at noon and I can do like the full conference if I want. I'm actually, uh, James and I are planning on doing Friday morning peer reviews like we're gonna announce it and be like come find us and we're gonna do peer reviews for two hours nice excellent we'll, uh the, the the organizers were on board although they haven't responded to me about some other stuff but like they're on board for that and we're hopefully gonna find some people who want who want that cool so. well i'll see you both there uh have fun and thank you everyone for joining us if you're still hanging we, we have a good audience it was about 2027 20, max i think uh, way, way better than any audience I've done on a live stream. So hey, I max out at 10. Know, I tell you what, this is the key. It's Twitch, YouTube, and uh, uh, Facebook all at the same time. Nice. So excellent. All right, bud. Take care. Thanks a lot.